their system working with CCC uh, and the Institute for Policy and Governance. And we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Mark Stern join us for a faculty forum today. Um, I'll read you a brief introduction here. Uh, Dr. Mark Stern is a professor in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech, where he teaches undergraduate courses in environmental education and interpretation and graduate courses in social science research methods and sustainability. <clears throat> research focuses on human behavior within the context of environmental conflicts, natural resources planning and management, and environmental education <laughs> He has published over 100 peer reviewed articles, book chapters, and reports, and has won multiple research and teaching awards. His recent book, Social Science Theory for Environmental Sustainability, a Practical Guide, published by Oxford University Press, translates social science theory and knowledge for everyday use by people interested in working on environmental problems. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I won't be able to monitor folks online, so grab the okay. Cool. So I'll like leave that off my screen so I'm not completely mute. But great. Well, um, I thought about lots of things we could talk about today. Um, but in communicating with Brad, we thought we might take a pretty broader approach. And then I decided as last night I would take a pretty responsible approach. So I'm gonna lay out a general idea. And then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that will actually chart the rest of this. Only two minutes to like delete slides and move around, and it'll be what you want to do. Um, so, as Brad mentioned, uh, I wrote a book about five years ago now, which seems like yesterday, but it's specifically about social science theories. And it's about a specific type of social science theory. So, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, some of the contents of that and how it might be useful to all of you. So, just to start with, we are going to kind of geek out a bit today and talk about theory. And, but the way I want to talk about it is really the practicality of theory. So, Kurt Lewin, who was a famous sociologist, did lots of early studies many years ago. I love this line there's nothing so practical as a good theory. Um, when I start talking about theory with a lot of groups, like you see, oh my God. It's going to be theory. We're just going to talk about like, big ideas. And, uh, um, my goal in this presentation and writing this book and a lot of my pedagogy is demonstrating the value. Like, how can you actually do stuff with theory? So that's where I'm going to talk about they don't like to think about big ideas. Well, you've taught other grads, haven't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and practitioners, I do a lot of work with nonprofit organizations, <laughs> government agencies, and you can see even like visceral responses to it. It's like, oh, God. Until we get to the type of theory that I want to talk about, which, which I'm going to call middle range theory after a famous sociologist named Robert Burton. So what Burton says is, look, there, there's these grand theories that are so big, you can't really do much about them. Oftentimes, we confuse these things for philosophies or big paradigms or like fields of inquiry, like political ecology, I would call this, which is the idea that like power dynamics influence the landscape. They're so big that you can't quite test the hypothesis yet. It's not narrow enough. And then all the way to the other end of the spectrum, you have something called empirical generalizations, which is like a correlation between two variables. So the example I put here is education tends to be correlated with both. Not that interesting, but it is like this thing you can observe. So Merton made this argument. There were some other sociologists at the time, and he's the guy who really made it famous, say, we'd all probably be better off if we focus somewhere in between. And that's where we can get to really practical stuff. So he coined this middle range theories. And the example I put here, here is sort of an under what conditions might X and Y lead to Z. So they tend to be predictive and testable. The idea is like we're trying to figure out what actions might lead to some outcome in a specific place. So these can be diagnostic or something that's happened in the past, or they can be prognosticative. If you want to make an influence somewhere, you might hypothesize something they're going to try. Okay, so these are the types of theories that we're, we're talking about here. Is that kind of clear the difference between these? Okay, cool, because there's lots of examples of grand theory and middle range theory, but I want to focus on these because I think this is where we can really push. So a lot of times when we're professors or we're students, we're looking for theory to help us guide our research. I'm going to talk a bit more about practice today. Like how can you actually use theory to like go and do community change? Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. So 
just to give you a sense of like where this is coming from and how I know stuff about this, I got to spend a whole lot of time digging really deep into it, um, which was awesome. I got a full sabbatical and I spent reading around on nothing but this topic and managed to write. Um, I can pass around a couple of copies if you'd like to just get a sense of what this is. But put them all together in this handy book um, that my grad students sometimes call Cliff Notes for Social Scientists. And it's purposefully written that way, such that it's very short summaries of theories that have a lot of empirical evidence behind them. And so there'll be a tight summary of a theory, and then there's a tight, like, two pages of, like, here's how you can, here's how you can take that theory and make a strategy out of it to better some sustainability initiatives. So it might be, let's say, I want to get people to recycle or something really simple. Um, well, here's three theories you might use, and if you use them, you're better off, because you have a better chance at achieving that end if you just go on a win from your intuition. Okay. So there's about 30 chapters that are all super short, like quick notes type things, and then there's vignettes at the end. So it might be like, Caleb lives here, and he has this problem, and he wants to deal with it. Here's how he takes these six theories and comes up with a strategy, and here's what happens to it. So it's all about trying to help practitioners see the value in this type of thing. Okay, so when I present this stuff, what I've come to recognize is that human brains work differently when we start talking about theory. So I want to get a sense for how your brains work. And one of the ways to think about this is a spectrum of how we like to learn or think about things. Now, one, one end of the spectrum, we call it principles first, and that you're on that end of the spectrum if you really like to think about hypotheses or theory, learn everything you can about a subject, and then go try and apply it to a problem. At the other end of the spectrum, it's applications first. I just want to get my hands dirty and try it. I'll make sense of it afterwards. I'd love just to show of hands to see, like, which end of that spectrum do you think you're on? Are you a principles first person, or are you an applications first person? So if you, are you applications first? I like to just try something first, and then I make sense of it. Oh, it's going to be so much easier. You're all principles first, people. <laughs> How many of you honestly think you're principles first? Like, you really like to learn as much as you can, and then you do it. Or if you didn't raise your hand, I guess you're somewhere in the middle, or it's like, it depends. A lot of us, we're kind of in the middle, and it depends. When I usually ask classes this, this is one time I did an online thing. This is how it usually comes out. If this is a spectrum, people are all over the map on this. And what I'm talking about here, using theory, is really a type of deductive thought, right? It's principles first which is really, really hard for a lot of practitioners. Um, because practitioners like to do stuff, and they don't want to sit there thinking about it for a long time. So when I teach this, I teach um, in an online program and also in an executive program in DC, it takes a lot of effort to bring folks from this end of the scale over to here to learn this new skill. Like how do you actually take a theory and apply it to a problem? For other folks, it's pretty easy. It sounds like it might be kind of easy for you in this room. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so what I was hoping to do today is to demonstrate the value of not just this type of thinking, but also in helping practitioners see the value of theory and how it connects, how it can connect to their actual work, real applications. That comes with a caveat that sometimes applications first thinking is is a good thing. Right? We have to do stuff. We can't think forever before we do things. Right? And coming in with three predisposed theories in your mind can blind you to certain things, which is another reason why I wrote this book, was to give people more lenses. Even as academics and scholars, we tend to have our favorite theories, or the ones that we know about, or the ones that our major professors taught us about. And that can be a really dangerous thing, because if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So the idea is to broaden the different lenses through which we can look at problems. And the real value comes, you know, if Lewin says, there's nothing so practical as a good theory, the real value to me is there's nothing so practical as having a whole lot of theories you can try on to a problem. See which ones give you best, better ideas to try in a specific situation. Okay. Now here's where this is going to get messy. I don't know exactly what you all do, but I was going to share some examples of some theories and how they apply to practical implications and real world problems. But to do that, I can't, I mean, it's hard for me because like there's dozens of theories in here and I can't choose. So you're gonna help me choose. I want you to look at this list of things you might want to do with social science theory. I want you to vote for one of these things as like this is the most important thing I'd like you to talk about. 
<laughs> think of the problems you're working on. It could be, all right, I'm going to do like some persuasive communication. I just want to convince people to do something. That something could be like number one or two. It could be getting people to show up. Or it could be like promoting people to vote for your candidate. Whatever it might be, vote for one of those if that's what you care most about, persuading people to do something. Um, the third one is what I was originally just going to go with, that since this is called you know, the Collaborative Coalition. Um, but it's about building stronger collaboration over time. And how do you make a collaboration that's resilient to all the stuff that can happen? Okay, so that's the most interesting you're about for three. Um, sort of underneath that might be, we could talk about it underneath number three, like how do you structure meetings to deal with like really challenging topics? And what's the best way to do that? There's lots of theory that can help us with that. And the last one is, it, there's a lot of interest in this always, it's like political communication. Like how do you deal with like partisan divide and when people are, really hate each other and they seem crazy to each other? Like what theory can help with that? Okay. I can cover like two big ideas, but not all of this. So that's why I want to vote. Brad can monitor online. You can vote with a number. Okay, so if you're online, just type a number into the chat, the thing that excites you most. If you're here, um, okay, number one. Raise your hand if that's the one. Okay, good. Number two, that's basic communication. Okay, okay, one for one, one for two. Uh, building strong and resilient collaboration, number three. All oh, five, twice you cheated. <laughs> <laughs> um, structuring meetings about challenging topics. Okay, I think we can cover that underneath um, collaborations and interest. And then uh, diffusing partisan confidence. That's you in the room. Okay, how did it come out online? So we've got uh, two for number two on, uh, online, one for number three, and one for number four. All right, so um, it looks like number three is the big winner with a secondary like number two, like a little bit of persuasive communication. Is that all right with everybody? I mean, these are just examples. Okay, cool. So let me, let me mess around with my PowerPoint for a minute and we'll get there. Uh, let's see, that word will be fine. I'm going to delete all my things and move to after the people can. So then I'll talk about those. And there and off we go. Okay, let's go down there. And I'll see if I can get this, <laughs> this projected and sharing again. All right. So we're going to start, we'll start with the persuasive communication stuff. It tends to be more straightforward. And it's really easy to see the application. Okay, so I'm going to start with a theory. Okay. Here's my fancy alt tab. Click on that and I share screen. Oh my god! Okay, we're starting with a theory called the theory of planned behavior. This is a very well known theory in social psychology. It might be one of the most well known and used theories. It's hundreds probably thousands of papers have studied this theory. What's interesting about it is it only works in certain situations. It works in a situation where somebody is actually motivated and able to evaluate like a proposition. So it doesn't work when we're just like reacting in real time or we're in a big hurry. It works when we're thinking about what we might do. So a great application of this is if you want to do persuasive communication, use this theory and if you hit these types of evaluation people make, you have a better chance of being persuasive. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you what these things are. So here's a little diagram of the theory, all right? And it says that we as humans, when we're thinking about something that we might do, there's three types of evaluations we make about that potential behavior. The first one has this really lame name, attitudes worth behavior. But there's a really easy way to think about it. It's just the benefits versus the disadvantages of doing the behavior. The benefits outweigh the disadvantages, so for a long period of time, we're going to act rationally and we're going to, like, most likely we lean toward doing it. What, this, what was cool about this theory when it was developed is the people using it realized, oh, why don't people always act rationally? Like, <laughs> this isn't a very good predictor of people's behavior, actually. And one explanation is sometimes we're not thinking, right? In which case, this theory doesn't apply at all. There's a whole other set of theories that applies. We're talking about intuition or gut reactions. But even when we are thinking, there's other things that matter to us. So the second thing, subjective norms, is we care what other people think about us. So if we're making a decision, it kind of matters, like, if I do it, 
Am I going to get sanctioned or rewarded by my peers for doing this? Am I going to look like an idiot or a hero if I do this thing? Okay. And the third one is kind of there's multiple perspectives and there's multiple pieces of it. One is how hard or easy is it? Right? So I might want to climb Mount Everest, but like I'm in my late 40s now. Um, also, it costs a lot of money. There's a lot of reasons why I probably can't do it. I might also not have control over the behavior, right? Like I might want to dig ginseng in Grace Mountains National Park, but I'm afraid there's park rangers there who will stop me because it's illegal. And last, I might not feel like doing the behavior would make any difference. Like I just don't have power. So this is classic voting behavior, right? Like it's why a lot of people don't vote. I might want to vote, whatever. Okay. And then you see over here, those things predict people's intentions, but intentions don't always translate to behavior. There's other stuff that gets in the way. Like I might actually get to the base of Mount Everest and get altitude sickness and not be able to go. Or think of all the things you've intended to do on your to-do list that you have not done. Yeah, a lot of stuff happens here as well. Okay, so how do we use this for persuasive communication? Well, if I'm trying to make a persuasive argument to get you to show up to a meeting, perhaps, or to get you to vote a certain way, if I'm just talking about the pros and cons, benefits, disadvantages, and expect you to be rational, that may not be effective. I actually have to convince you that whatever it is I want you to do is also socially acceptable, and it's also easy and within your control, and you can have an impact on the outcome. So this is a very easy one for folks who are trying to get people to do other things to like have this checklist. So often we end up talking only about this one here and ignore these. What we find is, and all these studies show, if you actually focus on all three of these and then try and remove intervening factors, classic example of this is like, literally you want to put the lever in people's hands and the boat, so we go pick them up and drive them there, right? Like you make it so easy that there's nothing getting in the way. They can do it. So when we're crafting our messages, we have these three check boxes, right? It's a nice theory. Now, how predictive is it of actual behavior? It's fascinating. Human behavior is already unique. If we measure all three of these things really, really well, it predicts intentions about 35 40% of the time. The intentions predict behavior about 35 40% of the time. It's still better than weight, as experiments have shown. But like, we're still not going to be totally successful. Okay, so there's one simple example of theory that people use for persuasive communication. But like, this is how these types of middle range theories work. They're like checklists, things to consider when you want to do something. Okay, so I'm going to go a little deeper into one piece of this theory that's really fun to talk about. It's kind of digging into subjective norms a little bit. You've probably all, uh, I forgot last one, you've probably all heard about social norm theory. Social norm theory basically is that subjective norm part. It means we care what other people think about us, right? But there's two definitional pieces I want to lay out here. One we call descriptive norms, and that's what we think everyone else is doing or will be doing. It's like, why would we come into a room like this? We sit down and kind of face the front. Like, you don't come in and stand up and face the back. Or the elevator is a classic example. Or you go into an elevator, you turn around and face the front. There's no good reason to do that, except that everyone does it. So that's descriptive norms. It's what we think everyone else is doing. We want to fit in. We tend to go with the flow. Injunctive norms are what we think others think we should do. Like they're the should. I really should remember my, my bags when I go to the store so I don't have to get class Okay. So let me lay this out with some cool experiments that have been done in the past. So this is a really famous example from a long time ago um, where the study was they would bring nine people into a room, and one of them was a confederate of the researcher. Actually, I'm sorry, let me say that again. One of them was not, only one of them was a test subject. The other eight were all in on this game. Oh. And you would look at this, and all the people who were in on it, well, first just answer. What's the answer here? Any doubt about it being X? Because there's no optical illusion here, it's X. But everyone in the room, except for the person who was the subject of the experiment, would argue for Y or Z. How often do you think it influenced the subject of the experiment to change their answer? About 70% of the time, it actually changed their answer. And said, oh yeah, it must be Y, that must be 
Right, so this is a classic example of descriptive norms. Back. Oh no, I lost a bunch of slides here. Okay, well anyway, yeah, it's a classic example of descriptive norms that we tend to go with the flow when we do other people are doing. So a great example of this is messaging, exactly how not to use them. Where did that go? There it is. Here's like, I can't believe I found this. This is exactly how not to use descriptive norms. So if you want people to do something, you want to make it seem like everyone's doing it, and they should join all the other people who are doing it. <laughs> This is classic. Please consider our environment. 70% of our, our visitors use more than one towel per visit. Only use one towel per visit. <laughs> it's exactly the wrong way to use descriptive norms, right? You want to say like, hey, join others who are, who are hanging their towels up and using them a second time. Like, that's how you use it. Very simple. But this is very predictive of human behavior, actually. Okay. So let's get into an example of injunctive norms. And this is a really famous experiment too, done by Wes Schultz and some other people out in California. So what they did is they wanted to reduce people's energy use. So they had all these big apartment buildings and they had a handwritten letter to everybody in the apartment building. And what they did is they told everyone, hey, here's the average energy use in the apartment building. Here's yours. And then there was a little message at the end, like here's some ways you can reduce your energy use if you want. So when they did that, the people who had above average energy use, when they saw that the average was lower than them, or everyone else uses less energy, the message actually moved them toward the middle. And that, it, it worked. It they actually reduced energy. What do you think happened to the people down here? It probably increased. Yeah. This is what happened. <laughs> they moved to their like, whoa, we can use more energy. This is awesome. We call this the boomerang effect. So it's something you didn't mean to happen, happens. But it makes sense. The theory. So they're like, well, what if we added injunctive norms to this, not just descriptive norms? So all they did, so interesting, all they did is if you were above average energy user, well, you know, we call this normal convergence, thing. they added a frowny face if you were like an energy hog. And if you were a below average energy user, they just added a smiley face to the message in the next stream. What happened? Even more of a reduction. This is a simple little thing, right? And the boomerang effect is gone. Um, People who use less energy were like, yeah, yay for me. So again, a simple demonstration of how like a super simplistic little idea can have a big impact on your success in what you do in initiatives. Okay, so descriptive norms, yeah, and injunctive. All right. Oh, we're working on time. So another simple, I'll use one more persuasive example, and it'll bleed into kind of some other ideas. So one of the things that a lot of marketers and social psychologists know about is called communicative framing. And it's a pretty easy concept to understand. Think about like a frame. There's this big message behind the frame, and I can move the frame around to get you to focus on different aspects of it. And it might influence how you respond. An exa a very simple example would be if I had a burger and I told you it was 20% fat versus this is 80% lean, which burger would you rather eat? You, the same. Well, yeah, it's the same, but if I tell you it's 80% lean, you're more likely to eat that burger than if I tell you it's 20% fat. I'm just focusing your, your efforts and your body on something else. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways to do the framing. There's one way that's very powerful. And this comes from a theory called prospect theory. This is Kahneman and Tversky who won, um, and they won the Nobel Prize for this, um, and some of their other work as well. But basically, what they decided, what they hypothesized was that we as human beings, we are more likely to take action to avoid a loss to something we care about, rather than to achieve a gain that's new to us. So, how do I use that framing? Well, the way I would use it is first to get you to Think about something you really love, and then tell you what you can do to avoid losing that thing. As opposed to selling you some new initiative. So let's say I'm going into a community and I want to get them involved in ecotourism to like deflect pressure off of a national park. They can make money this way. I can come in and be like, oh, it's going to be so great. We're going to build lodges. You're going to make money. It's going to be awesome. Or I can come in and try loss avoidance framing. Like, how might I do that? Anybody have ideas? It's kind of hard. 
So if I was thinking about this, I'm just making this up on the fly, sorry. Um, I'd probably think, okay, well, what do these folks love? Well, they probably love their community and their way of life. So how would I convince them that that's, there's some threat to that? All right, well, we know um, maybe they're on a slope and there's going to be some erosion problems if we don't somehow deflect pressure off of deforestation and hard or grazing or something like that. So I can demonstrate to them like, hey, this community that you love, unless we can stop doing this stuff, here's what's going to happen. I can show you where it happens somewhere else. All we have to do is this. And I make it easy. I, and I use a piece of the figure the acre, make it easy. I make it socially acceptable, show them somebody else that did it, and have a better chance of success. Rather than trying to sell them on something that's going to be great, I can protect something they love. So an example of this, this actually involved Jill, we were talking about earlier. Uh, years ago, I was giving a, a community presentation. I got invited to advise a campaign of uh, a candidate who's running for office in this region. And it was really late in the campaign. But anyway, I got like the key campaign people on Zoom call. And we should, I wanted to know like, how, do they, how do you typically convince people to vote for a candidate? What do you do like, when you're not going to do it? Like, well, the first thing we ask is what issue? What issue do you, do you care about most? So they knock on people's doors and say, we represent this candidate. What issue do you care about most? As soon as they say, we represent this candidate, boom, it turns political and partisan. Really yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, what do people tell you? And I can't repeat those things here. What people tell you? <laughs> Just think the most polarizing possible thing in the nastiest language you throw at them. I was like, what do you do? We don't know what to do then. We try and convince them that they're wrong. They're like, all right, let me get this. It's like you're trying to get them to vote for your person by convincing them they're wrong. Yeah. That's probably not the best strategy. So I was trying to think about like what theories could apply to this. There's lots of them. But one thing was this loss avoidance framing, right? This idea of like, well, what if we can establish something they love? And just tell them how your candidate is going to protect that thing. So how about we start with, hey, I'm your neighbor. And um, I live here too. I'm like, what do, you, what do you love most about your community? And no matter what they say, there's a way in them. Oh, well, let me tell you how our candidate is going to protect that thing in these turbulent times. So I asked this group to give it a try. And I also asked, hey, can you report back this help? Um, the candidate lost in the last slide. But <laughs> there were a number of folks like, I'm not doing that. That sounds stupid. But a number of them tried to do it. And here's what I heard back. I heard, you know, I think we might have changed the minds of like two or three people of the hundreds that we contacted. However, Almost everyone invited us onto the porch inside for a lemonade or a tea. And that's a pretty good start, right? Just, just a little refrain. Starting somewhere else can be really powerful. Okay. So we're shifting from persuasive communication to innovation. But again, my main goal is just to demonstrate the use of theory and how it can just give you new lenses on how to look at a problem. And this is particularly helpful when I work with like conservation groups and sustainability professionals who are stuck because they just keep trying the same thing because that's what makes sense to them. And then they start talking about these other theories like, oh, well, I'll try that. that. That actually sounds kind of reasonable in my case. Let me give it a go. Okay. So let's move on to collaboration. Yeah. Hey, look at that. I actually set it up okay. <laughs> All right. Real, real quick, Mark. I had a question. Um, Laura, do you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just thinking about that example of, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I was thinking of that example you're giving of um, encouraging people to reduce their energy use if they were, you know, more on the hog side. Um, and using the the brown face to sort of injunct you know the injunctive norm shaming basically um and you know i was thinking is, is are there examples in research where that has backfired because in people's minds they they take it a step further which is in that example perhaps um it's it's un-american to save energy you know or like it becomes politically divisive to do a certain action so yes. yeah, like sort of um, not going too far into shaming people one way or another. Right. So maybe just a frowny face was like a safer bet 
and the idea that, well, I can look at energy consumption as an economic issue, not just like a climate change issue, right? But there is quite a bit of research on who the communicator is perceived to be. And that, if, if we have time, we can go into that, like into partisan communication, because there are like a lot of ways to reduce identity threat. Um, so that's what that would be. It's like, oh my gosh, you're like questioning who I am and how I live. And it's over before I even consider your message. So yeah, let's, if we have time to go into that, um, we can go into that too. Some of the theories that apply there really powerfully are identity theory. And we've been using something called moral foundations theory to shift the way that we communicate with folks. And some folks in my lab have been doing research on that specifically. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, and maybe we'll, or maybe I'll try to slide it in as we're talking about other stuff. Okay. So is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'll, I'll look into those theories, and if you have extra time, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so I want to talk about collaboration since that was like the highest book getter. Um, so I've been working on collaboration in natural resource management planning processes for a couple of decades, and in all sorts of environments, a lot in the United States, um, a lot in South America, and a bit in Nepal, and a few other places around the world. And what's been really fascinating about that work is one factor, if we, especially when we do quantitative stuff, um, one factor tends to knock everything else out of our regression equations. Qualitatively, it makes a whole lot of sense too when we do qualitative research. And that factor is trust, whether people trust each other in these settings. So we've been working on this for a long time. There's been a lot of grad students involved in this. Um, so most people I see, everyone, for those of you online, everyone in the room shook their heads when I said trust, like they nodded knowingly. Okay, what's trust? How do you define it? Yeah, it is hard. We won't give it a go, except for Caleb, because he knows. <laughs> he knows the definition I use. <laughs> Anyone online want to try and chat the definition into the chat? I'm not moving forward until someone tries. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody give it a How do you how do you find trust? But it's not a trick question. Oh, somebody in the chat. Believe. Hope, belief. Okay, cool. All right, I'll, I'll count that as an effort. All right, here's the like psychologist definition of trust, and there are other definitions. Some define trust as a behavior, um, but most psych psychology folks, the sociology folks, trust, treat it as a psychological state. So trust is a willingness to accept vulnerability in the face of uncertainty. So there's some risk involved, right? Some people describe this as like faith. But basically, we're being willing to be vulnerable. And like, it takes a little while. You might have to think about that after. Like, does that really make sense? The more you think about it, the more it makes sense. Um, so let me ask you this then. What leads you to trust somebody? Well, depending on how long you've known them. Okay, if I've known them a long time, then I know whether they're trustworthy or not. But how do you evaluate them? It's not just whether you know them, because that can come out on either side, right? Past experiences. Okay, past experience, whether they performed well in the past. Okay, anybody have something different? Online, they've got experiences, uh, evidence they are reliable, uh, observed past behaviors. All right, so this is great. This is, this is typically how trust is defined when I ask about it in North America or Northern Europe. If I ask about it in other cultures, it can be defined differently. So what we've studied and what we've come up with is um, we've identified at least four different types of trust that we categorize based on how it emerges. Okay, so I'm going to lead you through these four types of trust, and then there'll be a punchline at the end of this collaboration. Okay. Uh, the first type of trust is innate. It's like built in, and there's not much you can do about it if you're a communicator or facilitator. It just sets the baseline for other forms of trust. The second two are interpersonal. The third has to do with like the context. So the first one, how many of you, raise your hand if you're like generally a trusting person. You meet somebody and like your trust is theirs unless they do something to, to violate it. 
Great. How many of you are generally skeptical? Like, I don't trust anyone unless they prove to me they're trustworthy. Yeah. Okay. For yeah. Me, that would be personal or professional. Ah, I love that you answered that way. Because as we're thinking about this, when I ask why do you trust, think about it, it's always the same reasons. Mm -hmm. Like, I might trust you to write, to co author a paper with me, but maybe not to drive my daughter home from her tennis match or something, right? There's different situations which we provide the credential trust. Okay. Dispositional trust is based on your own personal history and past experience, like the family you grew up in, bad stuff or good stuff that's happened to you in your life. It's built up over time and no fun experience or um, uh, clever communication is really going to change that for somebody. Somebody's disposition changes very slowly over time. So you might shift to a more skeptical or more open person. Basically, tell us what the baseline is we're dealing with that we know a little bit about. So in my field, if I'm going to a natural resource planning process and it's a public meeting and there's 100 people at the meeting and I want to say something, what might I assume about their level of dispositional trust? Are they there because they trust me? Or are they there because there's, they're worried about something and they probably have some distrust that I have to deal with? Right? We've actually, there's people who've measured that and yeah, trust is not very high at public meetings. That's why people show up. Occasionally people show up in support or because they're just academically interested in public meetings, but mostly not. Okay, the other forms of trust are actually. So the first one's the type that you just described. It's based on I call it calculus based because when I, if I'm deciding to trust Brad, I'm thinking, all right, is he good at this stuff? Has he followed through in the past? And do I think whatever he does is going to benefit me? That's rational trust. I can also have rational distrust. Like if I know every time I make Brad, he's going to punch me in the face, I would rationally distrust Brad. <laughs> um, so this is based on consistent performance, keeping your promises, and just being good, demonstrating confidence in what you do. And this, these were the answers you all gave. And in the business world, this is often how trust is thought about contractually and, and sort of an exchange thing. However, have you ever just met somebody and all of a sudden you trusted them? Like they reminded you of your best friend or your least favorite politician. Like it was a knee jerk reaction, it was there. Or like you have no idea how well somebody's going to perform, but gosh, you just really like that person. Like emotions really come into trust systems. So we call that affinity of trust. Affinity meaning emotional, basically liking somebody. So that comes with, if I assume like, oh, we grew up in the same town. Yeah, like it might push me towards this. If we can share positive experiences. If like you look me in the eye and we smile and we've got a beer together, it just seems like we have a lot in common, that's not going to trust you. Um, it could be that major response to charisma as well. So this is something we can build. I would also add, in addition to shared positive experience, you can build that kind of trust if you've gone through something negative together and had to rely yes. on each other. If you've suffered together. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and this is in some of my research, like in Southern Ecuador, where this is how trust was built. But like the park cars were suffering together in their own skin. That was the language they used, like with local people. Mm -hmm. And it made a difference. Absolutely. So sharing experiences that demonstrate some sort of connection. So we can do this too. We can set up, like we can do all kinds of trip, you know, the trust fall, trust building exercises. Sometimes those feel over contrived. But we can build these through active listening and being responsive and showing that we care and demonstrating that we're listening. So in a public involvement setting, it's not just taking people's comments, but it's telling people, here's how we're going to treat your comments. And within three weeks, we promise we'll have addressed all of them. We may not be able to use them in the decision, but we'll tell you why from here. Huge difference from, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, thank you for your comment. You can sit down. So I would love to see the copy quote. I think I'm guilty all the time, and most of us probably are of the second thing. Like when you're in a conversation, how often do you try to think the next thing to say, rather than like just genuinely trying to understand what that person's saying? Shift into that thing. That, that first element is a huge difference here. So I have all kinds of stories about this that I could share if you'd like as we, as we go forward. Um, but I want to get through these concepts first. So we have dispositional trust can't do much. Rational trust, affinity trust, are interpersonal. And you can imagine how you can build those through communications or interactions. And the last one we call systems-based trust. Sometimes we call it procedural trust, especially in natural resource management, planning processes or community meetings, things like that. It's a system in which we interact. If we can create a safe system in which people's risks are minimized, it lessens the need for interpersonal trust, right? We just have to trust that it was going to buy by the same rules. 
So systems that, and if you have a good system, you can build those other forms of trust. Right? Like if I feel safe, well, now we can focus on our personal relationships. So they tend to have these certain characteristics if they're good systems, right? Oftentimes, the procedures will be jointly developed. So like, hey, let's, let's come up with a charter for our group. Like, how are we going to make decisions? What happens when we disagree? Right? Like, we think about that stuff ahead of time. Well, it makes it a lot easier when we have our first impasse. Right? They're transparent. Everyone knows what the rules are. So now when I do group projects in my undergraduate classes, I actually have them take this theory, which, and they have to hit all the types of trust. How are they going to maintain these? It makes a huge difference. They feel like it's stupid up front. And at the end, like the one group that didn't do it ends up with problems. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have some language here that actually comes from uh, this book, Getting to Yes, a really famous book. Interest and Oppositions comes from that. So the Getting to Yes was written by folks from the Harvard Negotiation Project, done like negotiation all over the world, like in Palestine and really tough places. And one of their key principles is that rather than arguing a position like, we want a road or we want no road, we need to understand why people hold those positions. So we need to get down to the interest. Well, why don't you want to run? What are the things you're concerned about? Oh, environmental impacts? Okay, what else? Um, oh, aesthetic impacts? Okay. And why do you want to run? Oh, economic growth? Okay. Access to cultural sites? Okay. If we can make that list, those are the interests. Then we get to this next bullet. You put the interests up on the wall. And then anytime a decision is going to be made, we have shared criteria now for how we're going to make it. it takes us from face-to-face -face argument to shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder looking up at the wall, trying to make a decision. Right, so that can be one of the procedures that we use to develop procedural trust. Um, you'll notice up here I say maintained, and then now the consequences. There has to be some enforcement of the rules you create. Like, what if somebody constantly violates the rules? Mm -hmm. um, well, an external facilitator can be really helpful. Or just a really clear rule. Like, yeah, if you get called out three times, sorry, you're out of the group, it might be. So, We've done research on these large-scale collaborative initiatives in the United States. They're called the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. Mm -hmm. There's 20 or so of these across the U.S. and hundreds of thousands of acres. There are all these different entities, different land ownership types, private land, forest service, tribal lands, what have you. Most of them had a lot of conflict prior to this program. The program was, let's get these people together to collaborate to reduce wildfire risk. Because wildfire doesn't stay within your national forest or within your town or within this. So, as we were studying this, one of the things that we saw was the groups that took a lot of time up front to create these systems. Like the first nine months was creating a charter that everyone could agree on. Amazingly, some of those were the most conflicted at the outset. They got to work and got way more done than some of the other groups. One group in particular, where everyone was already friends. Like, yeah, we don't need this. We're good. We all work together. You know, let's just start on the stuff we all agree on. We'll get going. So they did. They, they were working pretty well together for a few months. And then there was this conflict that happened on another piece of land that wasn't what they were looking at here, but half the people were involved in that one too. And it just bled over because they didn't have any way to deal with conflict. This collaborative crashed and burned for about two years. They didn't get done. And finally, they brought next external facilitator and started all over again and start developing the system that would work. So taking that extra time up front makes a big difference. The idea is can you make it safe, a safe place to protect dissent so that people can disagree and have productive conflict. Like not the kind where it's like, God, I can't stand it, you're so good. But the kind where it's like, oh, I disagree, here's why. Tell me what you think, right? Productive conflict is what we want in these spaces. Okay. So here's those types of trust, and here's what we've learned empirically about these types of trust. We call it the theory that's developed out of this trust ecology, because if we found that diversity and trust kind of works like diversity in an ecosystem. So in an ecosystem, if a huge storm comes in and wipes a pollinator out, well, there might be some other pollinator there to fill the ecological niche while the system recovers. It works this way with the different forms of trust too. So you can think about this really simplistically on like what we call a dyadic level, like me and Brad. Like me and Brad have trust for each other, and we like each other. If I promised Brad I was going to show up here at one, and I failed to do it, if we like each other enough, in other words, we have definitive trust, he might forgive me and we can keep working together. If we didn't have that, forget it, I'm done. Right? Our relationship is kind of be really hard to recover. Like that. Might be hard anyway, but show up. <laughs> um, but we see this on the group level too. How many of you have worked 
in some sort of community where the leader was just so charismatic, didn't matter what, like you're just going to follow that person because they're just awesome. Like some of us probably have something like that that has happened. What happens when that leader gets promoted and has to work on the project? What we found is if you have all these forms of trust within the network, you're okay because you can rebuild that affinity of trust that you lost, that you have trust amongst all the other people in these different forms. Um, if policies change, procedures change, well, if we have good interpersonal trust, we can react to that. So what we found was in the short term, Anything, any collaborative can be successful with just one form of trust if it's there. But to be resilient, and we find this over and over again, and other people are using this framework and they're finding evidence to this too, you kind of need to build all of these. So, what, what this does to get back to the practical applications, like, I mean, you could just create a very simple spreadsheet like a, a table like this, where it's just like, okay, here are the types of trust. How are we doing? Right? What's it like? What's the strength of each form and how is it? Why is it that way? And what's amazing, so I, I used to do a lot of work, less now, but with like conservation organizations working internationally, like development groups or doing projects in places. And it was striking just something this simple, like a checklist developed from a theory that we developed. To be like, oh my God, we've been spending all our energy convincing people how good we are at stuff. And we've never actually just sat down and did but we've never actually come up with like what if statements about like, hey, what if this happens, then what? Like, no, there's 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 no risk mitigation for our project. We need to think about a system. Right? So just again, like having these theories, having a lens to look at why isn't this working can be really powerful. Okay. We have 12 minutes to go. <laughs> I can keep talking about theories and I'm sure that stuff, but I'm thinking maybe it's time to stop and have a conversation. Um, so let me, you know, I took those slides out, we won't, we won't go there. <laughs> Unless you all want to hear about partisan politics, do you want to go there? Or should we have a conversation about this? I'll get to like the points I wanted to take home with me. Okay, here's what I wanted to share with you, like the practicality of this type of theory. And it's practical for a lot of reasons. It's not just like, like giving you a checklist and a new lens for your problem. Oh, whoops, didn't mean to go there. There, that's where I meant to be. Anyway, um, having multiple lenses to apply to a problem. I also find this very helpful for students, especially students who come in with very strong values about something, and they want to write this way in an academic article. The Forest Service needs to consider the public more. It's like any peer reviewer is going to be like, no, what's your evidence for that? Why would you say that? You, it doesn't speak to your evidence. Having these theories, middle range theories in particular, helps you rephrase them and say, if the Forest Service wants to achieve these goals, this form of public involvement is more likely to help them achieve them. Right? It just takes those value laden statements and gives you another way to frame them. It's like a causal hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else can take it and test it. Or maybe you already tested it in your study and then you have evidence toward it. Right? So I find this really useful for helping students think about how can I write academically? Like to lay out here. Okay, and this last bullet is just like sometimes having done a lot of this research and trained students in it, I find that this is the only value that I have sometimes in a room. <laughs> like we're trying to solve a problem, right? And if you have like a sweep of theories beyond like the couple that we know really well, it's really helpful to be like, oh, you know, like here's another couple ways to look at the problem. How do you think this works in this context? Right, so it really helps us alert to the way conversations are going and what factors might be missing. I mentioned the danger of this type of thinking. Of, like, if you've got these theories, you're just going to fit them on, start deducting them. And sometimes that can blind you to things that emerge. In my practice, it does the opposite. As I start with the theory in my head, I'm immediately looking for ways to disconfirm. Like, so we do it something this right? We disconfirm hypothesis of those positives that are not anyway. So it's very helpful for me to be like, ah, no, that, that's something different. Let's talk about that part, because this other part seems to make sense. So I think it, it can be really helpful that way, just having these theoretical frames. Okay. I'll stop there. And we can go to our computer. Thanks for your attention. So what questions or discussions or disagreements do you want to or you can push me to start talking about parts of
Um, I'll start with um, when we're going back to talking about trust. And one of the things I've always thought about, um, particularly as communicators, is that trust tends to be, it can be transactional, but it is definitely relationship related. You know, if you build trust via a relationship, and that can be a relationship with a thing or a person or a system or whatever, but there's a relationship going on in there. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, how you can maybe look at some of these theories and apply them to those kinds of relationships. Yeah, I mean, like I said, in all of the research I've ever done, and my, my work is natural resource management and environmental conservation, the answer is always relationships. Like, that's where it always lands. Like, yeah, if you want to do it well. Like, I did this study as a doctoral student looking at why people do illegal things in our national parks. Like, and it was like, Bad illegal things, but like picking flowers, like lighting the park on fire, right. you know, vandalism, taking park guard sausage, things like that. It always came down to the relationship factor. And I remember when I went and talked to the to the park managers about it. You know, some of them were like, "Oh, well, they trust us because they benefit economically, or this and that." It's like actually, no, <laughs> that wasn't the most predictive type of trust. It was a thing of trust, the procedural trust in those cases, and you know, could be the fact that the the park decided to have a float in the Christmas parade. <laughs> And wow, I can't believe they did that. Um, one of the stories that I like to tell is uh, about Virgin Islands National Park. So I was doing research there, and I interviewed a couple hundred people. And one of the questions I would ask is, hey, there's a lot of conflict in that park. Like, people are doing all sorts of illegal things. It's like, it's a U.S. territory. The park is a symbol of colonialism. All sorts of bad stuff happens there. But I asked people, was there ever a point in time when the relationship between the park and the people that live here was better? And everyone who was alive during a certain time period, they all mentioned the same exact time period, like to the year. Like, yeah, it was year to year. I was like, well, what was different? Like, wait a minute, it just felt better. So I, I went trying to process trace that. Like, what was going on? So I found like people who worked for the park at that time, some old retired folks and the, the old wise people in the community. And then I looked at documents and I found that there was a certain superintendent that matched that time period, this four-year time period. What's funny about it is that superintendent later became the director of the National Park Service. But his strategy was he would regularly just walk the streets of the town, mm -hmm. talk to people. He would host regular parties at his house, at barbecues, like regularly, for park staff and people he just invited. It was super social. And whenever he had a really difficult decision to make, one that he thought was like, could influence local folks, he'd go hang out with the locally hired maintenance guys in the garage for half a day, just talk it out. Those were the those were the practices I could identify that were different that no other superintendent had done. The next superintendent was actually a local guy who came back to be the superintendent of the park, and it was terrible. And like everyone since has not been that great. But this guy was great. And it just goes to show like this trust stuff really seems to make a difference. So I was talking to park managers about this, like, wait a minute, you mean that? Have to be nice too. <laughs> Actually, yeah, if you want to protect the resources of the park, yes, that should be a job requirement. You need to be a nice person if you want to do this job well. Yeah. Because uh, enforcement isn't going to cut it. In that study, I, I interviewed over 420 people in these parks, and there were like 260 or something who like directly expressed they wanted to do something illegal in the park. Can you guess how many refrained from doing it because they were afraid they would get caught? They were set yeah. who said like, oh, the reason I don't do this is because I might get caught. These are huge spaces with like very little staff. Like you want to do something illegal in a national park, you can go and do it if you're smart about it. Um, so it does rely on relationships in that setting in particular, but I argue in all these other settings that I've been a part of, it comes down to that as well. And you, you mentioned objects as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, we call those boundary objects sometimes in our field, like these things like, all right, we might not trust each other, but everyone has faith in this map we're looking at. Like that could be something that really enables us to build some common ground around this thing that we have some faith in, right? Which is what's made it so hard right now that nobody seems to have faith in the same facts or information. So there's work to be done there, for sure. Sorry, that was the end of the boundary. Thank you. That's a great question. Anything else you want to talk about? But uh, 
you mentioned uh, uh, predictive capacities for some of the other uh, uh, theories. Uh, is, do you have thoughts about predictive capacity for trust and what the data is there? I do, um, but it's, all, it's kind of all over the map because especially the theory that we've developed, it's sort of new. So there's been some applications, but it's always measured differently and a lot of work's qualitative, so it's not like numeric. But in that study in national parks, I could predict with over 80% accuracy who within my sample was actively opposed to the national park. Mm -hmm. Opposing meant uh, public protest, vandalism, illegal extraction, violence, uh, arson, all, all these things, like that was it. That was it. It overpowered economic concerns, it overpowered environmental values, it overpowered social, it overpowered everything. Those other things were still, yeah, they matter. Mm -hmm. But this trust, and the way we measured it then, this was long before we developed this theory, was um, the extent to which people agreed with the statement. It was, I, do you trust the park managers to be fair and honest with the people that live? That was the same that could predict what they were doing. So, yeah, it, that was in a regression with all this other stuff, which just knocked everything else out pretty much. You know? So, pretty predictive. Um, when we go and look at political responses and like these identity threat situations, there's other stuff at play, but it's all related to trust as well, of course. Right, so it's almost a non-starter. One of the ways I think about it is there's all these theories that influence human behavior, but getting past distrust, like that's extreme identity threat, that situation of where you feel threatened by another person, those other theories don't matter. That's what you do. Like you have to first get over this hurdle, and then my theory of plan behavior is great. But if you start with theory of plan behavior, which I started with my dissertation. And then I had the trust variable, and all that theory of plan behavior stuff became this important. It was still important, but it, it wasn't the big stuff. Yeah, yeah great question. More people are using it, so we'll see. We may get some meta analyses that can do like a percentage of success. Uh, uh take up the last minute by asking about the other factors into all of this? Hugely, if you think about trust, I mean, fear is the perception of a threat, right? right? So th there's other theories about fear, but I mean, I think it's at the heart of identity threat, trust, and a lot of political stuff we're dealing with. One of the things that the environmental movements have wrong for so long is to use a fear message without accompanying it with an empowerment message. So if I tell you there's a huge existential threat, oh my God, it's so scary, we have to do something. It's a terrible message because I, I don't know what the people are going to ask. So it has to come with an empowerment message, which is, and there's this thing that's not that hard for you to do, and I can show you how it will make a difference. So I think some groups are onto that, making it easy and empowering people to do stuff. And a lot of folks are still in the old model of like, this guy is falling. I do something. We don't know what kind of messaging is just not effective messaging. And it's one of the things that Caleb and I are working on that's kind of exciting. You know, when you think about climate climate change mitigation, mm -hmm. like how do we stop fossil fuels going there? It's, it's a huge, huge, huge intractable issue. It's something just a bit slow. But we work on climate change adaptation, which is, all right, changes are happening. How do we adapt our community to it? We find it cuts through politics because it's very empowering. I can take action now if sea levels rising. There's stuff we can do, right? So it's like this refreshing area you're working in. The other side is way harder. It requires its large scale coverage. It still requires substantial collaboration. Like everybody had to move their house to Pocosa. Yeah, yeah, right. But it's it's local and tangible. You can see it. Yeah, yeah. that's one of the differences. Mm -hmm. Of course, let's say it's like, sure. <laughs> but theoretically speaking, it's more possible. <laughs> yeah, it's, see it and see how that happens. I do work in Cuba, and there they just move whole villages. So. Yeah. Yeah, okay, this village, we're just going to take you and move you 200 meters up the hill. You're going to be all right. We can do that in an authoritarian regime. Yeah, well, yeah, I've always thought that was a fascinating part of the aftermath of my gotcha. When there's a deeper question there, move these fishing people 200 meters up, up the coast, right? Away from the coast, when they move around the ocean, it be safe. Also, the right life. Yeah. So, it's not a just solution. Yeah, but it's all the criteria you're looking at. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me.